Great. Good afternoon. Thank you everyone for joining us. I know we'll be having uh, some more people hopping in, but we uh, want to get started because we've got a lot to talk about. Uh, my name is Emmy Betts. I'm uh, the Deputy Director of the Injury and Violence Prevention Center, and it's my honor today to get us started. Um, before I introduce our speakers for today, I wanted to go over a few logistics. So first, um, this is being recorded. We will post the recording on the web, and we'll also be sending out uh, later a PDF of the slides. Um, please feel free to put questions in the chat. We will have a moderated uh, Q&A session at the end. Um, so you can uh, go ahead and uh, put them in the chat as your questions come up. And then we would also love, um, since this is a, more of a um, meeting format, if you could put in the chat uh, a little introduction, your name, your background, um, it'd be great just for us to know who's here and for you all to see who else is listening. So now without further ado, um, I'm gonna uh, turn it, introduce our speakers and then uh, turn it over to them. So today's session is entitled Human Trafficking in Colorado, Force, Fraud and Coercion in Latinx Communities. Uh, our co-sponsor for today's event is the Latino Research and Policy Center. And I first wanna introduce Dr. Patricia, Val Patricia Valverde, who is the interim director of the Latino Research and Policy Center. Uh, she's also a clinical assistant professor in the Department of Community and Behavioral Health at the Colorado School of Public Health. And she'll be moderating uh, the question and answer session at the end. She brings extensive experience in developing, managing, and training patient navigation and community health uh, worker interventions. She uh, managed the five-year National Cancer Institute clinical trial on patient navigation at Denver Health. Uh, and she's the principal investigator of the Patient Navigator Training Collaborative. Uh, she's also on multiple national committees for patient navigation uh, and is currently on the Colorado Tobacco Review Committee for CDPHE. So our speakers today, we have two. The first is Karen Napolitano. Um, I'm going to introduce both of them and then turn, the, turn this party over to them. So uh, Karen Napolitano is the research and training manager at the Laboratory to Combat Human Trafficking. Uh, based in Denver, Colorado. She holds a master's in international development with a concentration in international human rights law from the University of Denver. Before completing her education, she spent eight years working and volunteering in Africa, the Middle East, and Asia, working mostly with education-based non-governmental organizations in post-conflict areas. She was appointed to the governor's Colorado uh, Human Trafficking Council Prevention Task Force in 2018, and the Equ Equitable Access Task Force in 2022. For the last few years, she's led training and education efforts uh, at her organization, training more than 20,000 professionals across rural and urban Colorado. And she is joined by Caleb Stewart, who is a senior staff attorney in the Rocky Mountain Immigrant Advocacy Network's uh, Anti-Human Human Trafficking Project. Uh, there, he represents survivors of human trafficking on their immigration cases. He advises and mentors pro bono attorneys on cases they receive uh, from the network. He trains legal and other professionals uh, on working with survivors of human trafficking, and he engages the public in advocating for the rights of survivors. Um, he joined the uh, network's anti-human trafficking project in March of 2018 after more than four years of providing civil legal services to survivors of human trafficking with Colorado Legal Services. He's board president for the Asian Pacific Development Center. He's a member of the Colorado Human Trafficking Council, uh, and he was the 2021 co-chair of the Criminal Justice Task Force uh, with the Colorado Human Trafficking Council. So with that, um, I am going to turn it over to our speakers. And as a reminder, um, please uh, introduce yourself in the chat and feel free to put any questions in the chat. Thank you again for joining us. All right. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for being here. Um, and thanks to those of you who introduced yourselves in the chat. It's cool to see where people are calling in from. And it looks like from uh, far corners of the state, which is very cool. Um, and it looks like we have a diverse background as well. So we're gonna speak to that a little bit. Um, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen now. Um, you don't have to see my inbox, sorry. <laughs> All right. All right, so um, yes, Caleb and I are gonna sort of tag team this presentation today. I'm gonna start us off with a little bit of a kind of a human trafficking 101 uh, briefly, 
Um, and obviously there's always more, you know, we always want more time and we never have enough. So we're gonna, we're gonna kind of speed through that introduction. And then um, Caleb as a practitioner and someone who's providing direct services um, is going to then talk about, you know, some of the, the needs of, of uh, populations that we work with um, from a civil legal and immigration law um, perspective. Um, so, uh, you know, first what we're going to cover is a little bit of uh, sort of myth busting, you know, there's a lot of myths and misconceptions out there of what human trafficking really is. So we'll talk through the nuances that distinguish human trafficking from other crimes um, from both a legal and lived experience perspective. And what I mean by that is, you know, what is the legal definition of trafficking? What, what, what constitutes a trafficking experience? But also from a lived experience perspective, how is that trauma going to show up for us as practitioners? And how might we, might we treat that trauma a little bit differently, um, knowing more about it as we will at, at the end of this hour. Um, we'll talk through some red flags and behavioral cues. Um, and then we're gonna, you know, Caleb and I are both gonna be focusing in on immigrant specific vulnerabilities and complexities around disclosure of lived experiences. Um, and I'll just put in a caveat here that uh, I recognize that not all Latinx populations are immigrants, of course, um, but uh, what we see is that immigrants in particular, or um, even folks who may appear to be immigrants are sometimes discriminated against in similar ways. So we see that showing up uh, in this trafficking experience pretty regularly. All right, so this term human trafficking, you know, we first started using it uh, 20, 20 to 30 years ago, sort of anecdotally, uh, to describe this laundry list of crimes. Now, it likely invokes an image or images in your mind when you hear this term. Um, and I'm just going to take a stab in the dark and say that, you know, potentially what you're what you think of when you think of human trafficking is young girls being trafficked for sex. Um, and the reason that we think this and the reason that, why those images pop into our minds is because that's what we're inundated with. That's what we hear about. That's what we see in the media. They make movies about it. Um, you know, that 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 dominant narrative is shifting a little bit away from a focus on uh, female gender uh, minors engaging in, in, in commercial sex, but um, it's slow, slowly pushing away from that. So it's, we're still inundated with most of that imagery. Um, so we're gonna spend a little bit of time sort of debunking that and talking through a broader picture of what trafficking looks like here in Colorado specifically. Um, the, the, again, the term human trafficking was first defined into legal statute in the year 2000. Um, after having used it anecdotally for a number of years uh, in the field. Um, that framework around this term uh, was, was laid out by the UN. So it was in Palermo, Italy. So it's called the Palermo Protocol. And I'll show you that definition. And I'll also show you our federal definition here in a moment. But it is important to, to know the beginnings of this movement really lay in um, a, a, an understanding of human trafficking as an immigration issue, as uh, again, 20 years ago or 22 years ago when we first laid this out, people talking about movement of humans across borders. Um, and so uh, the response to it initially was a criminal justice and immigration response. It was close down the borders, you know, arrest the perpetrators, punish the perpetrators, and we'll fix this problem. Now, 22 years later, further on in this movement, we've come a long way from there. Um, we're, we're, we're much more frequently involving survivors uh, in our movement and, and asking them what works and what doesn't to end human trafficking, looking at it as more of a systemic issue, and of course, addressing the root causes that push people into the vulnerabilities that may lead to them being exploited. So there's been quite a shift in the movement over the last 22 years, again, away from that criminal justice and immigration perspective and towards a more uh, holistic uh, public health approach. Um, so this definition that you're looking at now on the screen is this is how we first defined human trafficking, again, in the year 2000. Um, at the international level, at the UN level, we said human trafficking is a severe form of exploitation for labor, including sex as a form of labor. So sex work is considered labor in this international definition. Um, you know, that could be any form of sex work, pornography, webcamming, prostitution, stripping um, is considered a form of labor. In the US, we parsed out the definition into two separate categories around sex and labor trafficking, but in the international definition as shown here, it's included. Um, and the means by which someone is being exploited for their labor are through force or fraud or coercion or some combination thereof. 
So this is the this is what constitutes a trafficking experience. Now, many things lay on this um, sort of continuum of abuse or exploitation. Uh, there's many other forms of labor abuse. Wage theft, uh, for example, is one that we hear about quite a bit. Um, other forms of labor exploitation, and then uh, other forms of sexual exploitation that you may have heard about too, that sort of intersect with this experience of trafficking. But for it to be human trafficking, there has to be an a, a exploitation for labor. Someone is commercially benefiting from that exploitation. And the means by which they are enforcing this is through force or fraud or coercion. Um, now, we're not saying that if something uh, doesn't rise to this bar, that it doesn't matter by any means. Uh, in fact, many people experience multiple forms of abuse uh, or exploitation alongside their human trafficking experience. But I, I do want you to be able to tell the difference between the two and to be able to understand what the legal ramifications are of a, a trafficking experience. So that's why we're making this distinction, not because the other crimes don't matter, but because uh, it's important to be able to, to differentiate. Now, the slide you're looking at now is uh, the TVPA. This is our federal legislation here in the United States around human trafficking. Um, it was written in the same year as the Palermo Protocol, so also written in the year 2000, and it's reauthorized every four years. That reauthorization is actually coming up here in, in the US uh, soon. Um, that reauthorization also not only reauthorizes and updates often the law itself, but it also reauthorizes and updates the funding to end human trafficking, the funding that were, that that many organizations around the U.S. and internationally are receiving to uh, to practice anti-trafficking efforts. Um, so, so it's a really important piece of legislation. This framework um, in the U.S. we parsed out that definition that you saw on the previous screen into three categories. I already mentioned one distinction. One is that we separated sex trafficking out from labor trafficking um, into two separate categories. But we also made a third category for minors engaged in commercial sex. So you'll notice for uh, category one and two, they're both sex trafficking. One is the sex trafficking of minors. One is the sex trafficking of legal adults at 18 or over. Um, one important difference in these two categories is that for minors under the age of 18 engaged in commercial sex, there does not have to be force or fraud or coercion for it to be trafficking. So we actually made an exception in the United States to this rule because we decided as a society in the passage of this law that those under the age of 18 don't have the cognitive ability to consent to commercial sex. So okay. what, what I mean by that is even if they're consenting, they can't legally be consenting. And therefore um, those kind of uh, uh, old fashioned notions of a child prostitute or a teen prostitute are really not not uh, well not legal and also not true uh, according to this law. What we're saying is there can be no such thing as a child prostitute because no kid can choose to engage in commercial sex. They cannot legally make that uh, choice. Uh, therefore, anyone under the age of eighteen engaging in commercial sex is by definition a victim of trafficking. Um, and so sometimes these situations are easier for us to wrap our heads around. And that, like an example would be like a, a young, young child, like say a six year old who is being sold for sex by their parents. You know, uh, egregious though it may be, it, it is easier for us to wrap our head around because we can see an obvious victim and an obvious perpetrator, the parents in this case. No six year old kid is willingly engaging in commercial sex. But when kids get a little bit older, when you've got a, a minor who's say 16, who has more autonomy, who looks like an adult, uh, who might be walking on the street alone uh, and engaging in commercial sex, it's harder for us to differentiate whether or not uh, that's a, a victim, right? Uh, someone might feel inclined to say that person might be choosing this. And so we wrote this law to say they can't. Anyone under the age of 18 who's engaged in this commercial sex act is a victim um, because they can't consent, right? So even when there's no obvious perpetrator, even when somebody is, let's say, experiencing homelessness, and trading sex to meet their survival needs, that person is too a victim of human trafficking. Again, even when there's no trafficker, no perpetrator in this case. Um, for those who are 18 or over engaging in commercial sex, uh, there does have to be force, fraud, or coercion. Um, so uh, this is where we acknowledge choice. Of course, people engage in commercial sex acts by choice. If they're 18 or over, then they're a sex worker. If they are being forced or frauded or coerced into that situation, then they are being sex trafficked. Now, it's not very, it's not always easy to tell. It's usually not easy to tell. 
um, these, these situations of force or fraud or coercion are usually not what they look like on TV. You know, uh, and what we see in the media is people locked up in basements and chained up and, you know, in remote areas and, you know, uh, they don't have freedom, physical freedom. Now, it's, it's just not the situation in most of the time, because most of the time people are being trafficked by someone that they know, and often someone that they know and love. And that's also contrary to what we see on TV. What we see on TV is people are being kidnapped and thrown into scary vans and locked up in the basement. Um, most of the time, people are being trafficked by parents or guardians, intimate partners, uh, employers, other family members, or other people in positions of power, like teachers, coaches, or religious authorities. Um, those those categories that I just mentioned of perpetrators make up about 95% of cases. So uh, this notion of like the scary stranger kidnapping someone into a situation is really not what we see. Um, this third category here is forced labor. We're going to talk about both sex trafficking and labor trafficking today um, because it affects the populations that we work with um, both here in Colorado. So in the labor trafficking space here in Colorado, we see this in a lot of the industries that uh, you might think of, uh, kind of low wage, high turnover, uh, seasonal work, uh, high young people population or high immigrant population. So we're talking about agriculture, ranching, construction, restaurants and hospitality, uh, hotel industry, um, landscaping. Uh, uh, and then we also see it in domestic servitude. So people living and working in people's homes, you know, making $2 a day, not allowed to leave the house, sleeping on a mattress in the basement, right? Those kinds of situations. So those are, those are the, the typical industries where we see this. And then the other form of forced labor that we see in Colorado is uh, forced criminality. So anyone who's being forced to commit a crime against their will through elements of force or fraud or coercion for the financial benefit of somebody else is also being labor trafficked. So we see people being forced to mule drugs across the Southern border into the US under threats of violence from criminal gangs in Central America. We see people being forced then to sell drugs on the street here in Denver or across Colorado. We see people uh, being forced to beg to pay back a debt uh, standing on a street corner all day long and the money that they collect is going to their trafficker um, and other other forms of criminality as well, breaking and entering, shoplifting. Um, often it involves paying back a debt or a perceived debt. About 50% of cases involve some kind of debt. Um, uh, so, so this isn't limited to folks who are foreign born youth or females. That's just sort of a shout out to some of these myths and misconceptions that we do see um, that uh, foreign born individuals or immigrants in general, um, people are using immigration status uh, as a form of coercion. This is really common. Um, and it's common no matter what your immigration status is, because uh, if you have a relative who has a comprom you know, who has uh, unclear documentation or, uh, or who isn't necessarily uh, a citizen of the US that could be used as a form of coercion. Do this or I'll have your uncle deported. Do this or I'll call ICE. You know, so we see that form of coercion used commonly, um, but it's not making up the, it's making up the majority actually of cases, but not necessarily all of them. So it depends on who you ask and, and what uh, organization is offering the resources, but it's around 50, 50, 50% 50, 50 foreign nationals, 50% domestic here in Colorado. Um, this isn't limited to just youth by, by a long shot. I mean, uh, a majority of cases are adults, in fact, but youth are vulnerable to trafficking. You know, youth, youth's brain aren't fully developed yet. They, uh, they are physiologically more likely to make risky choices. They have an unequal power dynamic with adults. They're supposed to do what adults say. Um, and they're always online. So a lot of times young people are contacted online as an as a entry point into potential exploitation. Um, and this isn't limited to just females, again, not by a long shot. So uh, more females are trafficked for sex than other genders for sure. But uh, when it comes to the bigger picture, including all forms of trafficking, um, it's somewhere around 50-50 too. Um, we see uh, trans individuals disproportionately represented in survivor populations and really anywhere where a marginalized population intersects with this, we see them overrepresented. So uh, it's all genders, it's all ages, it's all demographic backgrounds that are affected by this crime. Um, another way to think through this definition is to, uh, is to acknowledge this action means purpose model. So um, if you're trying to make an identification in your work or with a client that you're working with, um, you could think through this model. One thing from each one of these categories has to be present for it to be tra trafficking. So there has to be an action, a means, and a purpose listed here. 
um, by far and away, the most common action is recruitment. So traffickers are looking for vulnerable people. They're not marauding the neighborhood and snatching people off the street. What they're looking for is people with needs that aren't being met and they're offering to meet those needs. So someone who is experiencing homelessness, someone who is looking for work and can't find work in the formal economy, someone who is uh, looking for love, who has experienced abuse and uh, maybe has an unhealthy version of what a healthy relationship looks like. And the trafficker can step in and fraudulently, as you'll notice, as one of the means, offer a job or a place to stay for the night or love. Um, and that's what hooks somebody, gets them connected to the trafficker. It's a grooming process. And then uh, eventually in weeks or months or uh, some amount of time, the, the means are then exerted and someone may be exploited in that situation. So Again, by far and away, people are recruited. If you if you ask you know anyone in any neighborhood and any of the, the folks who are here today across Colorado where vulnerable people are, we could all answer that question. You know, it's not a secret where vulnerable people are in our communities. Traffickers know those places too. They're going to those places. Sometimes it's online, sometimes it's in person, and they're offering people the things that they need. That's the most common action. Now, the rest of the actions also happen. Sometimes people are locked up, harbored. Sometimes people are moved around. That's pretty common. So. People are moved from place to place or across borders, but also as a reminder, people are trafficked out of their own homes uh, across Colorado and sometimes never are leaving their hometown. So transportation is a possible action, but not necessary for it to be trafficking. Um, sometimes people are provided, like I provide access to my kid in exchange for drugs or money or rent, something like that. Um, and sometimes people are obtained. That's that snatched off the street narrative. It's just much less common than we think. Now, the means are through force, fraud, or coercion. You've already heard me give a few examples of those. Um, the force is physical force, right? So locking someone up or physically assaulting someone. I'll also note here that um, in cases of labor trafficking, often uh, sexual violence is used as a form of physical force in a labor trafficking situation. So they're not being sex trafficked, they're being labor trafficked, but they're also being sexually assaulted or uh, they're experiencing sexual violence. Um, fraud are these fraudulent promises, right, that, that gets someone hooked into the situation. And coercion is this incredibly powerful tool, right? Do this or else. Do this or I'll have a family member. I'll call ICE on your family. Do this or I'll take this compromising video that I have of you and I'll, I'll show it to the world. I'll, I'll send it to your parents. I'll put it online. Um, do this or, uh, you know, you'll get in trouble. I'll call the police. Uh, do this or you lose your job, you lose your housing, I'll kick you out, you know, you won't be able to live here anymore. So these are coercive tactics and they're incredibly powerful. People don't usually need to be locked up physically in order to obey their trafficker because of these coercive tactics. But the big star there is to remind us that if the person is a minor engaging in commercial sex, then there does not have to be coercion, force or fraud. Uh, in that situation, they are automatically a victim of trafficking. The purpose is commercial sex or labor or, or ser services. So at its core, trafficking is about profit. And that's what often differentiates it from other crimes. There has to be that commercial component. Um, I'm just gonna talk through one example, just to make a distinction between uh, wage theft and labor trafficking here, um, before I turn it over to Caleb in a couple of minutes to really lay into all of this. But um, we do see you know, a little bit of confusion. You know, What's the difference between X, Y, Z? So I'll just make a clarification here. Wage theft is the non-payment of wages. Um, there's many forms of wage theft. So it might be uh, not getting paid minimum wage. It might be not getting paid for all the hours that you work or being forced to work off the clock. It might be um, being forced to do jobs that aren't part of your job and not getting paid extra for it. So there's different forms of wage theft out there. Not all labor trafficking, sorry, not all wage theft is labor trafficking, but all labor trafficking is wage theft, right? So uh, no one's getting, people aren't getting paid what they should be in a labor trafficking situation. That's true. So here's an example, um, like over the pandemic, let's say you've got a 21 year old young person who uh, is an undocumented immigrant from El Salvador and he's working as a dishwasher in a restaurant pre-pandemic and then the pandemic hits. He's living in a three generation household with his parents and uh, his wife and child um, and his wife and child are also undocumented. Everyone works in the service industry. So everyone's out of work and they're freaking out. Right, so he uh, starts going door to door looking for a restaurant that's open, uh, that's doing takeout that he can work at, uh, finally finds one that will hire him. Um, that person, uh, they make an agreement, they shake hands, he's gonna get paid $12 an hour cash um, to work six days a week, 12 hours a day. And he's gonna get paid every two weeks. So he works every day for two weeks. Um, and at the end of two weeks, expects to get paid. That was the agreement. 
Um, and at the end of two weeks, business owner just says, I'm not going to pay you. What are you going to do about it? Right now, uh, he might say, uh, you know, no one's going to trust you. You're there's no proof of you working here. I'm a respected business owner in this community. Get out of here. Now, if that young person can walk out the door and go find a lawyer like Caleb or a law enforcement officer, he could report that it is a crime to not pay someone for their wages, regardless of immigration status uh, in our country, in the US. Um, however, he might not know that, or he might be too scared to go to authorities and he might just deal with it, right? He might just take the loss of two weeks and go look for another job. That's what happens commonly. Um, however, that's not what happened in this situation. What actually happened was the business owner actually locked the door and told him that he, if he dared not show up for work tomorrow, that he would have him and his whole family deported. So the young person came back to work the next day and worked every day for four months without pay. Um, that's when a wage theft situation can turn into a labor trafficking situation. That, that young person, that 21 year old was now facing physical uh, force because he was locked in and physically assaulted and coercion under threats of losing his, or, or threats of ICE being called. Uh, so he felt like he had to stay. Uh, that's when those means come into play. So that's when a wage theft situation can turn into a trafficking situation, but it's not always the case. Now I'll just quickly say, COVID's made everything worse. I think that's probably not a surprise for everyone. Um, those who were already being exploited continued to be, but now at greater risk of exposure to COVID. So people who are being exploited in meatpacking plants or uh, in domestic servitude situations or restaurant situations were, were still being exploited. You know, the traffickers didn't say, hey, head home, go be safe. There's a pandemic on. They said, keep working but now they were at greater risk of exposure. And then there was all of this additional precarity, right? 20 million people out of work, probably a heck of a lot more, and, and, and thousands of people losing their homes. We did have an eviction moratorium, but most evictions are informal. And so people were losing their homes, they were losing their jobs, they were desperate, and those kinds of situations lend themselves to potential trafficking. Um, I already mentioned some of these. So, so this is um, sort of what we are fed, right? the ideal victim the the what we see on tv is usually uh young females uh usually portrayed as white or asian um being trafficked for sex and they usually look really scared and innocent and i'm not saying this doesn't happen it does right um the problem is if this is our only narrative to describe trafficking then this is the only thing we're ever going to look for and therefore the only thing we're ever going to find and we are missing it right we have to change what this narrative really looks like we have to change who the, the perpetrators are and who the victims are in our mind's eye, right? First, internally, so that we can we can actually be looking for uh, what, what's really been in front of us all of this time. Um, I just want to, I was gonna play that video, but I just wanna uh, mention a few red flags before I give it over to Caleb. So um, we see a lot of physical indicators and behavioral indicators there's a much longer list than what I'm showing you on the screen here. Um, but uh, I'll go over what we see frequently um, and, and then we can answer some questions at the end as well. So we see a lot of unexplained injuries um, or evidence of prolonged infection or time since injury. So someone shows up and the infection is really bad or they broke their arm three weeks ago but it never got set and you're trying to figure out why they haven't accessed healthcare in such a long time, it's likely because healthcare was being withheld. Um, so traffickers don't want those individuals to have contact with healthcare providers. And so they're not allowing them to have that contact until it's really bad. Um, we see a lot of malnourishment or generally poor health, malnutrition, dehydration, exhaustion. This is really common in both sex and labor trafficking because people who are hungry, thirsty, and tired are less likely to run, right? They're less likely to push back. Um, we see that mixed with forced drug use in some cases. So you've got lack of sleep, lack of food and water and forced drug use. That's a perfect storm for a trafficker because you've got memory that induces memory loss um, and, and other uh, negative mental health outcomes that make that person less likely to report or less likely to be believed when they do report. Um, we see frequent or repeated STIs or pregnancies. We do see some tattoos sometimes in, in uh, sex trafficking situations. We see people branded by their pimp. Um, and then we see repeated motion injuries or, um, you know, situations where someone's working 18 hours a day with very little food or water, uh, doing the same thing over and over again, maybe with equipment that they weren't trained to use. And so we see injuries that might be caused by that. Um, when it comes to behavioral cues, um, people who don't know where they're at or where they came from or can't articulate their address or where they're staying or who they're staying with. 
Um, anyone who has inconsistencies in their story, it's another red flag. It doesn't mean that it's trafficking necessarily, but um, you know, someone who can't tell you the name of their uh, the person who they just told you is their family member, but they only know their first name, or you know, they're they're telling stories different from what the others in the group are telling, or they're they seem to be telling a, a story that was rehearsed. Um, these these inconsistencies could be red flags for trafficking. Um, someone who's speaking on behalf of someone else, that's a big red flag. If you've got, especially an employer, um, maybe who's carrying everyone's identification, who says, I will interpret for you, that's a really big red flag. Um, uh, any Anytime someone doesn't have control over their own identification, and especially if that person is trying to speak on behalf of others, you have a, someone who's obviously got a lot of power in that relationship, and that should that should set off some some red, red flags for you. Um, Let's see, anyone who exhibits any kind of trauma behaviors, paranoia, anxiety, submission, tension, um, this, this kind of situation is incredibly traumatic. So if you notice trauma behaviors, if you've been trained on trauma in the past, um, these are also pretty big red flags for human trafficking. All right, so I will stop sharing my screen here. I don't know if any questions came in during that time. No, we will have a Q&A at the end as well. So you all can... Um, uh, Sandra was mentioning a welfare, a child welfare case in Florida in 2010, um, an example. So why don't we go on to Caleb? Great. Thank, thank you, thank Kara. You. So I think you can see my screen and hear me now. Is everything looking good? Great. So. I'll continue on with what Kara was talking about. And just to give a little, um, we wanna reserve some time for questions. So please do be thinking, continue thinking about your questions. Um, to give you a background of where, what Remain does, because where you're looking for trafficking is where you're gonna find trafficking. And so some of the disparities you see is if you're not looking for certain types of trafficking, you're not going to find them either. And so you do get very different uh, numbers of um, prevalences of human trafficking, depending on you talk to, like, for example, law enforcement is like 90% sex trafficking, whereas if you're looking at um, immigration attorneys and civil rights attorneys doing lawsuits, the civil lawsuits being filed are about 90% labor trafficking. So I work with Remain, and so again, that's going to show you the populations that we're working with. Um, from Remain, I mean, we're obviously looking with immigrants, and so that's going to define the type of population, type of trafficking that we see. This um, saves thousands of dollars every year. It's completely free to check if you are eligible. And sure, uh, somebody's. Uh, <laughs> Learn more about the below this video. Check if you qualify for free. Can someone um, mute, please? But only Sarah, if can you mute? It's not me. It's the Samsung. Yeah, there we go. Thanks. Sorry about that, Kim. Great. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and so, Romaine, what we're doing is we're working for justice for adults in immigration detention and then also children and families that have suffered abuse, neglect, or violence. And so, we're getting the referrals to our um, organization either through our direct re outreach to um, those in removal proceedings um, at the Denver Immigration Immigration Court or the detained immigration court in Aurora, as, all, as well as re referrals from organizations, including um, health clinics and others that we have connections with that see immigrants. And so that's where we're getting referrals from. And we're getting referrals from the hotline that LCHT um, staffs and manages. Within Remain, um, we have two primary programs, a youth and families program and a detained adults program. So again, we're seeing individuals that have some people of immigration need that are youth or families being, meaning that they're 21 years or younger, or they have someone 21 years or younger involved. And so like it might be an adult that sends money back home to a child back in home country, well, that would that would count for our youth and families um, program. And then also detained adults that are detained at the, um, the, the private run facility by the GeoCorp in, um, in Aurora. The children's program works again with immigrant children deportation, deportation proceedings. And the primary ways that we're interacting with them, we're finding those individuals and then working with them is they have, we give know your rights presentations when we know that there's going to be an unrepresented child at immigration proceedings because children are not given, given attorneys if they don't have one. And so you can have a, a toddler sitting on the table representing themselves against um, the, 
the judge representing our judge and the attorney representing the government. And then we also, then we, once we have individuals identified, then we either provide direct representations ourselves. We provide some pro se assistance, meaning that we, maybe we can't find an attorney for them, but we help the individual uh, represent themselves, or we look for an attorney in the community to represent themselves. Uh, the detention program is very similar in the range of relief that we're providing. Again, we're doing know your rights presentations to hear about the issues that they're facing. We're doing pro se support, helping them do their cases on their own or representing them ourselves or we're looking for an attorney in the community to represent them. And so when we're hearing about trafficking situations, it's coming from these times where we have contact with an individual and in, 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 uh, and the immigration context. And so they're facing deportation often. And so then we're looking at what relief they might have. And so the vast, vast majority of the individuals we have, in, have come in contact with that have been survivors of human trafficking don't know of themselves as a survivor of human trafficking. They may have known that what they went through was something they didn't like, and it was something that was very painful or challenging, but they didn't know there was laws against it in the United States that called it human trafficking, nor that there was, um, connections to that for certain forms of relief. And so I'm going to go into that a little bit now. Hey, Liv, um, quick question. Uh -huh. Sandra is wondering, did you say that the um, that your agency serves adults financially supporting a child in their country under the Child and Families Program? And so what, it, what I, when I'm defining the populations that we serve, um, the Children's Program serves children that are minors under 21 or adults that have children involved. And so that involvement doesn't have to be a child that we're representing. It can be like we can still represent that adult in their removal proceedings if there's a family or a child involved in some form. And that does include the, the adult working in the United States in order to support their child back in home country and they're sending money back to their home country. And so as, and so as they're working in the United States. And so like we're not providing any financial support for anybody, if, but that would be somebody that we may help in their immigration case because that would be considered a child and family or they may have a US citizen child in the US. It doesn't have to be the child that we're representing, but um, one population, just because we there's so much need out there, you really do have to kind of choose the populations you work with. And so unfortunately we can't represent everyone. And so one population that, that we don't have a program for are adults that don't have any children involved and aren't detained. Um, the idea behind that is that they have more time to kind of save up money and try to find an attorney on themselves, whereas we're looking at the more immediate needs of other populations, and that's why we've kind of made some of the decisions on, on the two programs that we have. Thank you. Um, and so in the human trafficking program that I head up, um, we're working in both of those programs, the children's program and the detained populations program. I'm doing follow-up screenings if there's questions, but then anybody from the organization can represent them with their cases. And I just might fight for rights and support. Um, what does the population look like? And so this is we kind of start getting into what's the population like in Colorado? What are we seeing? What does human trafficking look like? Where is it identified? And so in our population, is it is mainly male identified. We serve far more male um, survivors of trafficking and female survivors of trafficking. It's also far more, uh, we see far more labor trafficking survivors and sex trafficking survivors. And some more myths to bust that kind of uh, Kara got us started with. Another one is just looking at um, smuggling and so smuggling versus trafficking. And so sometimes people think that trafficking requires movement but it doesn't require any movement. You could be born and raised in Denver and still be a survivor of trafficking. It's that force bar of coercion that makes it trafficking. That's the hook. Um, and when a smuggling situation, sometimes you hear called human trafficking, what is really just a smuggling situation. A smuggling situation is something that's done in an agreement between an individual and the, what they call a coyote or somebody that's going, they're going to pay to help them cross the border. So this is a crime against the country. They've made an agreement. It's a mutually agreed apart agreement. There's consent to have somebody help you cross a border um, without um, legal, without the legal ability or legal right to do so. And so that's the smuggling. Trafficking again, is, as uh, Kara was stating, it requires some type of forced part of coercion. It, there's no consent involved and it requires a benefit through labor. 
though smuggling definitely can become trafficking. And so one population that we often see vulnerable to trafficking and see many types of trafficking occurring is somebody who agreed came into agreed upon relationship to help them cross the border. But then once they are out in a very deserted remote area, there's a lot of vulnerability there. And so if the trafficker wants to take advantage of the vulnerability, that's when you might see the tra so I'd see the situation transform and become a situation of human trafficking. And so many of the individuals that we're seeing at the detention center or under the individuals that I'm talking with in the children's center, they started as an agreement for smuggling, but then during that process, the smuggler decided to say, well, you know what, we're out in the des desert and if you want me to not harm your kids while we're here, or if you'd want me to keep giving you food, well, then you're gonna have to have sex with me. Or they have a child that they took off a bus or a train that they're now transporting across the border. They tell that child, well, while we're doing this, you need to go panhandle on the street or you need to carry this backpack of drugs. And if you don't do this, I'm gonna harm you, I'm gonna kill you. I'm going to, uh, here's this, I have the, your address of your family. Let me show you this picture where you know I know your address of your family lives. I have connections to the gangs back in Honduras and I'm gonna have them hurt your family if you don't do this. And so that's something we often see where that smuggling turns into trafficking. For sex trafficking situations, also I want to talk about we because I do have clients that are survivors of sex trafficking. It's just not as prevalent as the labor trafficking. But one of the differences is that, as Carrie was saying, what I don't see, what I haven't had a client of, is somebody that was a minor that just grabbed off the street and thrown in a van and then kept in a locked door. I haven't seen that occur. What I have seen is this familiar relationships. Maybe there's an, a child that's in a very a vulnerable home and not a safe home. She's looking for love. She's looking for safety and she goes to try to find that from somebody in the community if that person ends up taking advantage of that need or maybe there's there's bills or, pay, or there's uh, debts that can't be paid off and so as they're searching for a way to pay off their debts that's when they find themselves in contact with somebody that promises to help them either provide that love or to provide an ability to pay off those debts and once they have form that relationship, then it becomes a situation where they're like, they're coerced into starting to provide the sexual commercial acts. And then maybe to continue, keep them to continue to do so, that's when you start seeing threats of violence that come in or addictions to drugs and things where they're controlling them in other ways. But that was the sign of sex trafficking situations I see. Um, another type of sex trafficking situation you may not think of in your mind when you hear about it is that it does have to be a commercial sex act, but when you're defining a commercial sex act, it doesn't have to be the type of situation you have in your mind where you have a pimp providing the individual to a buyer, and then there's that trans cash payment being made to the, to the pimp. A commercial sex act can be anything of de minimis values. So there's an exchange of value. That value doesn't have to be cash or money. It can be many other types of things. And it's like in that situation of the um, situation of the smuggler, where they force the individual to have sex with them, that can be sex trafficking because the thing of value exchange was not harming her kids. That's also a thing of value. And so another situation we often see in Colorado is, is familiar relationships where it's uh, a situation of domestic violence that turns into human trafficking when this continued use of force, fraud, or coercion is used to compel sex or to compel, compel working in the home, doing domestic work, or other types of labor, um, which leads to another type of trafficking I wanted to, to discuss that we often see um, that you may not think about, or, okay. uh, it, and that is sponsors. And so to get released to, so sometimes when an individual is crossing the border, they get detained and they get held either at the border, they get transferred to Aurora. And the only way to get released is they need a sponsor who allows them to stay with them. And so they get released to that sponsor. Sometimes um, the individual crossing doesn't have a close family member that they trust and live in the United States. And so those sponsor relationships can be end up being very tangential, or maybe they met a friend of a friend of a friend who said, you can call me. Well, then that creates another power dynamic in the relationship. And so what we're seeing is individuals getting released to sponsors that they hardly know. And then that sponsor deciding, I'm gonna take advantage of this and I'm gonna to try to convince you that you owe me for letting you get released. 
And because you owe me, you either need to have sex with me or you need to take care of my kids for free or you need to go paint in my painting job or do siding or do roofing. And so then you're seeing this a labor trafficking situation being controlled by a sense of obligation or now they might, once they have that control, then they might start, start using also um, a perceived debt saying, lying about saying to get you released, I had to pay the government $2,000 for transportation, which isn't true, but it's something I hear about. And so then they feel like they need to pay off that debt. And so then they start, start working to pay off that debt, but they don't see that debt going down and they just keep working and keep working. And so this sponsor relationship is another situation we often see. Um, when you're working in the health community, the, the, um, the, the field of health, that's one other situation that we often um, get referrals from because the primary concern of a lot of my clients is supporting their family and home country. And so as long as they're getting paid even a little bit, even if they're putting up with a lot of other force and control and they're not getting paid what they're promised, um, as long as they're still able to send some money back home, they put up with it and they keep doing it and they keep doing it until um, they get injured on the job. And now they're not being allowed to see medical care. That injury gets worse and worse and worse up until a point and they're being re re refused or not allowed to um, see medical care until it get, comes to a point where they can no longer work at all, at which point they're not receiving any money. And that's when they go to look for assistance. And so then I had a client that had a hernia that finally got so bad they couldn't work. And so he had been putting up and putting up with everything from his employer, went to get help on this hernia when it finally kept him from working. And then that's when he was identified and got referred to us. And then we got to hear about all the other things going on in the situation and tell him, you know what, you actually have some other options. What this, what the things that happen to you have a name, it's called human trafficking. And with that, there are um, benefits that you might be able to seek out. And so real briefly, some of those benefits are U visas, T visas, continued presence, adjustment of status, special immigrant juvenile status. And again, this isn't a presentation for attorneys to know how to run these cases and get somebody approved for any of these statuses. It's so that you don't know that they're out there and that they're to know that if you're in contact with somebody, you might be able to say, hey, you should talk to an attorney to see if you do qualify for one of these forms of relief. And so a U in non-immigrant status is um, for an individual that's been a victim of about 28 different kinds of crimes. So not being a victim of any crime doesn't qualify you for this, but there are a wide ranging number of crimes that do. You do have to cooperate with law enforcement um, because one of the purposes of it was to strengthen the ability of law enforcement to investigate and prosecute crimes, which in turn makes the com our communities safer, um, and also to provide relief to crime victims and their family. Um, one requirement of the U is that you cooperate with law enforcement and they must sign a statement or what's called a supplement B saying that you have been cooperative. Um, it gives four years of status. After three years, you're, the individual is able to apply to be a, a permanent resident. The T visa is very similar, but this is for specifically survivors of human trafficking. So in this situation, you're, you're a survivor of human trafficking, you meet some of the other requirements for the T visa, um, and then you're able to get four years of status. After three years, you can apply to be a permanent resident. One addition that you get from the T and you don't get from the U um, is refugee type, uh, type benefits. Again, with the T, you do have to cooperate with law enforcement, but you don't actually need to get law enforcement to sign anything. You can prove that cooperation in other ways. Continued presence is probably the quickest status you can get, but it's not a permanent status. And it's also something that the individual can't apply for and an immigration attorney can't apply for. If the individual is working with law enforcement, then law enforcement can request um, a continued presence, which gives one or two years of status um, and a, a work authorization. And so it's also the quickest way to get authorization because right now a T visa is taking roughly um, a year to two years to be approved. A U visa is probably upwards of, I mean, it's getting close to 15 years now. Uh, the U visa is almost getting to a point where it's not, uh, it's not serviceable because the, the, the delay is becoming so long. There is a way to get a work permit while you're waiting, but that's still probably five years out from this time that you start. And so it's, uh, when I first started doing U visas, I used to get them improved in four months. That is not the case any longer. T visas, um, again, is about a year and a half, probably. Continued presence can be much faster, but you do need to get 
law enforcement to be involved. And if it's a state law enforcement, they need to go get the federal, the feds to help them apply for it. Um, green cards come through the T or the U after three years of presence. There's a little bit of differences between when you can apply between the two visas, but we don't really don't need to go into that today. Special immigrant juvenile status is the final status to go in and talk about. And this is for minors that have been abused, abandoned, or neglected. And the unique thing about SIJS is that it requires going into a state court. And so you're getting a finding from a state court first that says that it is not in the best interest of the child to go back to their home country or to be under the custody of their parents, one or both of their parents, it doesn't have to be both, but one or both of their parents. And it is in their best interest to be placed with a guardian here in the United States. And once you have that order, then you can take that to USCIS or immigration and uh, the to immigration and get and, and apply for SIJS status. SIJS is probably the quickest way to get um, permanent residency, um, but there's sometimes benefits to doing the T or T the U instead of the SIJS. Now, well, we did want to give a, quite a bit of time for questions, and so um, let's get to the questions. I actually was going to ask you to show that last slide. I think that was a really nice summary of, you know, the this the the audience, the people the people on the webinar are case managers, they're researchers, academics, and so I really like how you you say, well, what is our role? And it looks like it's help in identifying, being aware of those red flags, um, building trust and supporting recovery, um, so knowing about resources and uh, education and ac advocacy. W what else would you add? You know, I would, I would add the, I, I haven't had a chance to mention the hotline, so mm -hmm. um, at some point, Caleb, I'll, I'll share my screen again whenever, yeah, whenever, okay, yeah, cool, so that people can just see that uh, there is a human trafficking hotline here in Colorado. Um, and so it's just an additional resource for you all um, when you do, you know, use your new new tools of identification um, and advocacy that you have this resource. It's 24 seven. You can call as a service provider. You can call as a survivor um, looking for either uh, resources for if someone for kind of all the things that you could think of that someone might need from transportation to housing to mental health support to uh, long-term survivorship needs like long-term housing or uh, survivor mentorship or whatever tattoo removal, you know, lots of interesting things that, that we can provide um, through our community partners um, or tips to law enforcement if that is so desired. We are only mandatory reporters for minors. So if the person is a minor, we are mandated to report that to either law enforcement or the Department of Human Services, but if the person is 18 or over, we are not. And so um, if you are interested in reporting something like this, you can let us know that that is the case and we can pass on those tips to one of our trusted and trained law enforcement officers. So not someone who's just said like a random number that we're calling, but someone who really understands the nuances of this crime and who will respond in a trauma-informed way. And Kara, can you mention the healthcare training that you offer? I think a lot of people on the webinar um, you know, work in health centers or hospitals. So what's available? For sure, yeah. So we've developed the Laboratory to Combat Human Trafficking. We're a nonprofit based in Denver, but we operate statewide. And we developed in a, a, a group, a working group with healthcare providers, us and survivors of both labor and sex trafficking, uh, uh, four hours worth of content that we deliver to healthcare professionals. Now, often healthcare professionals are too busy for four hours, so we get that. So we also have a one hour version, a two hour version, a three hour version, and a four hour version. Um, but we can offer that live in person or um, virtually on Zoom. Um, and uh, we offer, uh, we often partner with education departments at different hospitals or clinics to provide CEUs as well for those. Um, and, and of course, they're they're directed specifically at healthcare providers, so specific red flags and, and tools for you to use. And you have web resources, really robust resources. Correct. Yeah, we co-created with the Denver Anti-Trafficking Alliance Healthcare Subcommittee. Uh, you don't need to know all of these uh, acronyms, but uh, we co-created a, a protocol development toolkit uh, that is Colorado specific and healthcare specific. 
that can help you to develop your own protocol. It has long lists of red flags and behavioral cues, all of the uh, laws that you'll need to know, uh, mandatory reporting requirements, HIPAA considerations, as well as uh, tips on how to have these hard conversations with folks that you may suspect may be being trafficked and referral resources. It's about a 16 page document that we have in, on our website uh, in PDF form that I can send out to, to you all um, and by request. Thank you. What questions do you all have? I think the most uh, recent questions have been answered. You can unmute or type it into the chat. So this isn't the typical webinar. It's not an we're not presenting on research or <laughs> um, this is real real practice. So what what questions do you all have for? Practitioners. No? Oh, I think. Uh, what systems or policy changes are needed to protect victims? Good question. I bet Caleb and I have very different answers. Do you want to go first? Um, I mean, there's lots and lots of things that I that I have in mind and so there's a lot of things that need to change the immigration in the immigration world but those are all federal policies state-wise kind of the issue like I mentioned that I was the chair of the criminal justice task force last year and it's kind of my issue for state policy is is getting um vacature and see and record sealing for survivors of trafficking and so if a survivor of trafficking has um picked up um, a criminal history during that trafficking situation. It can be drug use, it can be drug selling, it can be a lot of different things. Um, and for a variety of reasons, they may not have brought that um, up during the process of, of being um, prosecuted for that crime out of fear of their trafficker. And so afterwards, there should be a way or a mechanism for them to do vacature, which means that you go back and say that um, they should never have been convicted, convicted of this crime to get rid of it, or sealing to kind of seal those records so it doesn't prohib prohibit them from getting housing and work in the future. Um, many states have this, Colorado does not. Um, and so that's, that's my big issue for a state statewide policy is to get vacature and sealing for survivors of trafficking. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think that's high priority as well. Um, any, you know, I, I guess I'll just throw out there, like if we're talking kind of big picture policies, I might go into some nitty gritty stuff too. But I think um, one thing to consider is policies to protect all vulnerable people, right? Like really thinking about, you know, what are the root causes that lead to precarity? What are the things that lead people to vulnerability? And, uh, you know, of course, immigration law is, is, is a big one of them. And that's a federal, those are federal policies, but, uh, but also sex workers, also people who use drugs, also people experiencing homelessness. Are they able to access their rights? Are they able to find safety? Um, are they, are they protected by our laws so that though they don't become then victims of trafficking. So kind of further upstream policies looking at those root causes. So we find ourselves advocating for laws um, uh, for wa the wage theft law, for example, that just uh, was uh, updated in this past legislative session. We advocated for that, uh, making sure that labor protections were protected for, uh, for folks who were experiencing wage theft and that they could access recourse. Um, we find ourselves advocating for the murder to missing indigenous uh, uh, sorry, murder and missing indigenous relatives bill uh, that also passed um, uh, establishing an office of murder and missing indigenous relatives since uh, Native American populations are disproportionately affected by so many public health issues. So things like that is where we find ourselves advocating pretty often in this movement. Great, thank you. Um, so I think we're actually at the end. Uh, Kara, Caleb, thank you so much for packing in so much information. You know, one thing I hadn't really thought about, Caleb, it was when you mentioned the sponsors that mm -hmm. just hadn't even occurred to me. So that was really, uh, really interesting, really helpful. So both of you, thank you for sharing uh, your expertise and, um, and your time. And everyone have a wonderful rest of the day. And we will send out the, the slides and uh, we could send the, the link to the uh, resources. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have a great afternoon.